This is supposed to be 19 meeting, right? Yeah. You were sure. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to start by just thanking the organizing committee for the invitation to talk about uh, clinical trials. So uh, for those, uh, I know most of you in the room, and I'm really, it's like going home, seeing people, and having conversations with people who have been living this dream for quite some time. But um, I articulate myself as a clinical trialist. Um, I am, um, I hold a chair at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, uh, and I sit at the University of Pennsylvania, but when the invitation came, it came from uh, Martha Curley from Boston. So, so then I had to remind people, I haven't been in Boston for like 15 years, um, but I'm excited to uh, think about clinical trials as it sits within this space. And I want to remain positive. Um, because sometimes you can get, as clinical trialists, uh, hunting for those numbers every single day, you can get kind of uh, depressed. But I need to disclose that currently um, I'm a co-PI with Scott Watson on a study uh, on um, post-intensive care syndrome. We're mapping out post-intensive care syndrome uh, funded by NICHD. And then I'm also a MPI on the PROSPECT clinical trial, which is a two by two uh, adaptive randomized trial studying prone positioning and high frequency oscillatory ventilation in, um, in PARS, but we won't go there. But that's funded by um, NHLBI. So I have to uh, flavor what I'm saying based upon uh, the partnerships that I work with people to answer, I think, compelling questions uh, in our field. And when you think about clinical trials, to me, what we need are adequately powered studies that can make a difference. We need them to be done in the shortest period of time, and we need them to be able to be funded. And what we need to do is have a sufficient number of trained clinical trialists who know how to do this in the field to ask and answer compelling questions concurrently, all playing together, answering our questions. And it's a quandary, really. Um, if you think about you know, our field, um, our field, and we all live it, you know, we can't do trials like our neonatal colleagues or our dark colleagues, adult colleagues, because we just don't have the sheer numbers that they have. Um, in our field, it could be considered a vulnerable patient population by definition of the NIH. Uh, and what we study are really rare diseases based upon that. Our primary endpoints, and I, you know, Jerry and I, like years ago, tried to struggle with what were the best out, uh, outcomes to be studied in uh, critical care. And then once you start studying them, they're never the straight shot of the same number of patients over time. You have seasonal variation, they go up and they go down. So it's kind of hard. And then you layer on top of that this developing human being from many, many different perspectives. The heterogeneity of age, size, development, organ maturation, and diseases clustering by age on top of how do you really study that? You know, do you think about designing your trial with very narrow, rigid criteria or wide, you know, get them wide? you know, but decrease your signal? Do you stratify by age? Do you control for age? You know, and what is the best group that you should study in from a developmental perspective? And then how do you analyze the data that you get? Because nothing ever goes from point A to point B. It kind of vacillates over time. And if you measure differently, you're gonna miss things or you're gonna smooth out effects and you're not gonna be able to really answer your question. Um, and so the current state of clinical trials is that they take time, money, and they take co uh, collegiality, colleagues who will do these studies with you. Uh, and this is an example of the Restore clinical trial that we ran, started in 2002 with just a research idea that was pitched at the PLEASI network, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, these individuals that you see here um, raised their hand and said, I'll participate, okay? So then we ran a pilot study with an R21 funded by NI, um, NICHD. And then we built instruments so that we could really study it. So we needed the instruments that could drive, you know, 
um, sedation management and withdrawal assessment. And then we repetitively asked for more funding to do a multi site clinical trial. We got funded. And at one point, I counted all the people who were involved with this study. It's 550 people were involved in running this trial, okay? And this trial, you know, my first grandchild was born when we started it, and there she is in the middle by the time we ended it. It just took an enormous amount of time to do this. And so it's the persistence of hanging onto a question and keeping your head in the game and to do it, and really relying upon everyone in this room to help you do the trials that need to be done. Um, and I want to say that when you think about trials, we've made significant progress. Uh, over time. When we started doing trials, it was like an N of one sitting in a room trying to figure out how to do trials. Uh, and I want to review some of the progress that we have made. Uh, we're the envy of all of our adult critical care colleagues because we have the policy network. You know, so we've built research capacity within our field by having a group of people who come to a meeting twice a year, you know, and interact with, with, with each other, pitch their ideas, and, and, and grow them. Uh, and from this idea that was like 20 years ago born, we now have numerous NIH-funded uh, investigators, hundreds of um, you know, publications. Neil could probably give you the exact number of publica publications. And then we have all these subgroups that come and meet. So you know, when, was it? Uh, you know, a year and a half ago, I was at ATS doing a talk on, you know, the conundrum of how to do clinical trials. And everyone in the room, mostly adult people, were like, wow, you have this wonderful network and you could do this stuff. And it took a lot of time and energy to build a network and really the dedication of the people who continue to come. And to pitch the idea of the network, you know, we're thinking about how to do better clinical trials. So if you're not coming, you know, to Tahoe for our spring meeting, we have two major giants in the field coming to uh, the um, meeting to talk about platform clinical trials, to talk about how we could do different types of trials that we typically do. So Derek's going to be there to talk about that, and then precision you know, instrumentation within our trials by Michael Mathay. So if you haven't registered, you should. There's no rooms left, but maybe, you know, Anessa could find you some. But the network itself, I think, really helped our field move forward, you know, as a group of people working together. Some people come to the meeting, some people don't, but it surely has helped. But it also, we're not the only act in town. Across the entire world now, there's other similar pediatric networks. You know, and within the prospect clinical trial, we're tapping into the networks because in order to answer our question, especially for the hit that we took during COVID, we had to engage Pac-Man, ANZIC, the European group, and the clinical trials network up in Canada to participate. And currently, we have 55 sites across the world participating. We have 10 more on deck that Amy Cassidy is trying to launch. And then we have three people who are interested in talking to us more. And we, we have to be able to, within this clinical trial, finish it. It's an important clinical trial in the field. But we have to look for colleagues across the globe to do this. And so we have Polisi, but there's other networks. And we've learned to partner with them. In the early days, I would be afraid to do multi-site clinical trials. And now it's like, oh, whatever, another 50, another 100, whatever. But I, you know, you can go across uh, the world and find colleagues like yourself uh, to answer the questions. We've also, as a discipline, dealt with our heterogeneity uh, because fundamentally, one PICU is not another PICU. They're all different. They think they're all the same, but they're all different. Fundamentally, they're quite different. And we had to deal with the heterogeneity of practice across all these different areas. And you are all dealing with the heterogeneity of the data coming into two major you know, electronic health records. But all these people, most of who uh, led these um, initiatives are in the room, we now have the floor. We now have agreement on how to manage patients who are critically ill from many different perspectives. So we didn't have consensus on what to do with some of our major problems, but now I think we do. And the newest one is the PALIC 
Ravi's in the room. The polit all the polit papers are finally published in Peace Critical Care Medicine. Um, and we're still waiting on the common data elements. I think it's almost done, but hopefully it will be soon. But we now have uh, the capacity uh, to think about how to start uh, leveraging um, practice within multi institutions across the world so that we speak with one voice. And, you know, I had to uh, do a shout out to Nelson's group that was part of the PLIC2 criteria who made two research recommendations and how we needed to network and how we needed to be able to develop some electronic uh, tools to better manage patients with part, with part. So as we develop our guidelines, we need individuals like yourselves in the room to help us figure out how to make it happen from an implementation uh, perspective. Um, we also are using novel designs. Uh, the prospect trial is using a two by two, um, uh, it's a two by two factorial re response adaptive trial. So we're not going to enroll our original power of 800 patients. You know, we're going to enroll um, patients in a 300, and we're now at 203. So who's counting? But when we hit 300, we're going to do a randomization update. And we will reallocate who gets what. And it's not going to be an equal distribution in four cells. We're going to change it up and we're going to move that. So hopefully, we think we'll be able to answer this question at 500 patients. And that's kind of like where the signal is going. So we're not afraid anymore of using alternative ways to design straightforward uh, RCTs. And by design within our larger trials, we are embedding uh, biorepository and follow-up studies so that even if we have a negative clinical trial, we'll still have the capacity to answer you know, the biological basis of disease so that we can feed that inf information into hopefully more precision type of uh, randomization processes. And we have to look at what happens outside the ICU. So one of the implications for the virtual PICU is to get out of the PICU. <laughs> you have to get out of the intensive care unit to see what's going on. And you know, Scott, I think, is really leading that effort uh, uh, nationally. We saw, we've also learned to play together. You know, when we started doing this, we used to fight like all the time. You know, like, you know, who's going to enroll who and who was going to, who's going to have what center. And if you're participating in one trial, you couldn't participate in another. And we spent an enormous amount of time, you know, arguing the point of how we could share patients. But now we've really, I think, adopted an abundance mentality. You know, it's like, let's just get all the trials going. Let's find ways to work together and play together. And so I think that definitely has changed. And we've also learned, because we haven't had the informatic support within our clinical trials, to pass the baton from one trial to another. So we used to do trials, take the whole thing down, and then lift the whole thing back up again to do another trial. But now, you know, sharing data coordination sites, we were able to go from, you know, the restore trial to half pine to prospect and to another ship's trial. So it's the infrastructure, the people who are dealing with the data understand the data, and it wasn't a complete, you know, take down and launch back up. So that was another thing uh, that we've learned to do. And then we also learned to put our data into biorepository or into uh, data sharing. And I wanted to show you this because usually coming up with your data sharing plan was really at the end of the application, the whole grant's written, and you throw in a you know, paragraph and you're done. So this was two, on page 257 of a 260-page application, one little paragraph. But we did deliver. You know, uh, Lisa Osaro and David Whippy got the restored data into the biorepository, and Steve just answered, Steve Shine, where are you? You just answered a question using the data. And then it was kind of weird because you know, you're using the data and it's like, you know, you delivered it to the biorepository. You want people to go in there and take it. I don't need to be on the paper. I don't need to be the author, you know. And it's so, it's nice to have people to be able to use the data. And it's serious now. You can't write an application now without a data uh, sharing plan. But how do we refocus now? Um, you know, what and how can we do this? Um, what should we be able to do differently? Uh, how can we do our science differently? You know, and 
uh, Chris, we were at what that scepter meeting in Washington, and we were at this you know FDA meeting on sedation. You know, I said to Chris, you're going to have the best job in the world because I'm getting out and retiring. You're coming in, and you're going to be able to use data in a different way to do trials. But definitely, we can, um, in an organized way, use our data so that we don't have to take down and build up. We can embed uh, our trials within an existing data structure. So Nelson, have at it. Um, and it really is time for us to think differently, even about all the argument that we have on syndromes and what is a syndrome and what is PARDS and what is not PARDS. Uh, but we have to design smarter trials uh, that are targeting therapies to, befe to benefit specific sub uh, cohorts, not the whole thing. You know, so we have to get a little bit more strategic on who we're implementing uh, our interventions on. Uh, we need uh, genetic and biomarker-based risk stratification so that we're doing the right intervention to the right patients. Um, and then we need also to be really real about this and include uh, uh, under and over the skin variables. Uh, we may have different effects based on race, ethnicity, and SES. We know that. You know, but we never have enough power to be able to really look at that. And so we need to start looking at that because you can't send somebody home, uh, you know, when they don't have the capacity to take care of themselves uh, within home. So we have to re really rethink, you know, how we, how we even describe that. Um, you know, this is a really, you know, Mary and Heidi, I think, are leading the charge and trying to get us to get more identification of phenotypes and some phenotypes. We need more research uh, like this. And then Des, uh, De, uh, Tessie October's leadership in uh, NICHD trying to get us to th really think about race and ethnicity and the differences um, in our patient populations. We also need to rethink outcomes. So Jerry, we're, the work is still not done. We still need better outcomes. Um, and we need to not pick outcomes based upon the funding source, but really what's important to the patient population from which we're implementing. And we have to move also to patient reported outcomes. What's important to the patients themselves? Um, and even, I'm sorry, when we did the core outcome set, you know, what is the core outcome set for Pete's critical care? We had two people there that were parents and they were drowned out by the researchers and the rest of the population. We need more data in asking parents themselves what's important to them and to uh, their families. Um, and digital outcomes uh, or digital um, you know, uh, uh, endpoints. Uh, my husband right now has a link in, so I can tell all the time what he's doing for, with his EKG, uh, monitoring his AFib all over the place. But We'll have more at-home technology that we can send people home with uh, and linking that into home monitoring, patient's response. Um, you know, uh, Randall, the ICU is all lined up moment by moment, time by time, but we have to make sense of the data. Um, and then really, uh, Mike, I'm really scared about AI, what you just showed. Um, if it's not truth, you know, if we can't even get to the truth, we don't, we don't even know what we know and what we don't know. And we operationally define it. The only sense that we really have is biological variables and biological sense, but all the human factors don't get captured. And so it's pretty scary. Um, and then really um, thinking out of the box of you know, sending people home with virtual connections. Uh, we ran a study um, you know, in the cardiac uh, intensive care population, looking at how to monitor them virtually at home. Families loved it. They didn't have to drag their kids back into CHOP uh, to have things that we could have done, you know, remotely. Uh, the transitional care model at the University of Pennsylvania, I think, is a great model for outcomes. We just need to embed that into uh, future work. Um, we also need to rethink our research designs. Um, now that we have the capacity to build uh, master protocols, we need to use those master pro uh, protocols. We need the, uh, the rogue management of critical care to be streamlined. Uh, we always have eligible but not enrolled patients into clinical trials because the physicians think that they don't want to manage the patient according to the protocol. 
So we need to limit the, the extent that people can actually do that. Um, we can run parallel trials together. There's no reason why we can't. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of classes of studies that we can if we had more informatic support. And that's the umbrella trials, the basket trials, platform trials, and the um, MOT trials. This was a great paper that kind of digs deep into describing the different types of trials that could possibly uh, be run and why they're so uniquely different. Um, so we're intrigued, at least I'm intrigued, with the platform trial. And so hopefully at Polisi we'll have more conversations around building the infrastructure support to do that. I do think we need Beyonce to shed some of her millions of dollars to float the whole thing. I think we can do it with crowdsourcing and we need not rely on the NIH um, all the time. So, you know, moving, and this is reality, those of you who collect data for um, clinical trials, you know how long it takes to fill out the case report forms. Uh, and that's the rate limiting factor. Uh, we need to move, and I think that's where we are right now, moving to real world uh, data extraction from the EMR uh, with a human interface to make sure that it actually is the truth coming in to decrease the human burden. We're struggling with prospect right now because of the re research infrastructure rotation. You know, we don't have nurses, we don't have RTs, we don't have the RAs. We need to streamline th this process uh, so that we can do that. But every element of running a trial can be done electronically every single element. You can get alerts, you can say the patient's in, it could decrease the random okay or not, you know, okay in a trial. It could suck all the data in, it could populate the CRFs. So we're there right now. Um, and then this is uh, Jim Fackler's role in SOCO. I didn't know what the hell in SOCO meant, but we did write a grant application <laughs> once, and we even put it in twice, and it was scored, but you know, to, uh, embed in so-called model modeling of what's happening at the bedside so you don't have to do it on a patient. You can ask, you know, before you do something, is this the right thing to do? And I think that's where we are right now. I definitely think that the future is bright for us. And I wish I was maybe 30 years younger. Thank you.